Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahillahi rabbil alamin wa asyhadu an la ilaha illallah wa liyus salihin wa asyhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. My dear brothers and sisters, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Parents from all over the world and welcome to another podcast. This is your brother Gabriel Romani and as promised, we are going to be a bit more engaging and connecting to different brothers and sisters professionals across the world to discuss the topics that are of interest to you the muslim ummah and one of those topics of course is education people are messaging me asking me brother gabriel we're living in the west what can we do as muslims people talk about homeschooling people talk about all kinds of alternative motives uh, sorry uh, alternative you know situations of education and of course post covid 2020 2021 a lot of schools were forced to go online and you know this model was was something that really took over so people are confused and they want to understand as a muslim in the non muslim countries in the world what is you know the future of education and today alhamdulillah i have with me my dear respected brother michael abraham from the united states of america minnesota mashallah and assalamu alaikum brother wa alaikum assalam how are you alhamdulillah good jazakallah khair alhamdulillah so today brothers and sisters we're going to talk about the first episode inshallah is the first title in a series of episodes brother uh, michael abraham is going to be joining us inshallah to discuss these issues so the first one that we picked for you tonight is fixing muslims issues in public education and before we get into that I would like to uh, give the mic to brother Michael Abraham to tell us a little bit about our, himself about his background so we get to know him you get to know him inshallah and then we're going to have all the links in the description so you got to click there check out the description going to have his website his Instagram his Twitter so you can connect with him you can talk to him directly as he is an expert in the educational field alhamdulillah so bismillah brother Michael Abraham Barakallahu fiik. Let us know a little bit about yourself, who you are. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair, brother. Appreciate you uh, having me on. Uh, you know, I'm not used to these types of platforms, um, but, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm happy to be here. Alhamdulillah. And uh, share my perspective and, uh, and my work and what I can offer to uh, your audience, inshallah, by Allah's will. Amen. So, yeah, I'm a public school teacher in the state of Minnesota. Um, I worked. Uh, I worked in private education initially. Initially in the Arab world, uh, I didn't initially study um, education. I have a degree in political science uh, from the University of Minnesota. And um, you know, my 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 area of specialty is ESL. So, uh, but specifically, what I've mostly worked in in my career is um, integrating content area instruction to ESL learners to EL learners. Um, and, and also a lot in teaching language arts. I also teach language arts too. So I've worked in both elementary and high school uh, equally in my 12 years in the profession, first half in elementary school, uh, second half in, in actually middle and high school. Uh, um, all but three years spent in schools with overwhelmingly Muslim populations. Um, and, uh, you know, moved on to professional development in the last four, four or five years. Um, still, still working in a school. But, um, but also starting to work into professional development, both at the school level and the school I work at. Um, and then in, in, in broader, broader first in the state of Minnesota and now in different states. Um, now, most specifically with, with uh, broaden it is I, I created an educator training pro program called Engaging Muslim Students in Public Schools. Uh, I initially did it as an extended course with two cohorts of teachers in a large district here in Minnesota. Um, I then did it in spot sessions at different conferences and also uh, with a, as part of a program with a university here in Minnesota. And then I started offering it privately. I started privately as like a long day training, some long all day training seminar um, uh, privately here, uh, mostly in Minnesota, but also in the state of Washington. And um, then I spent a year writing it into a book and then also putting it into an online course. So it's now something that is, it's now work that's available uh, to anyone who, who, who wishes to take it. So alhamdulillah, you know, at, at right now over a thousand, there's been over a thousand educators in, in the United States who've, who've done this training. Um, the demand for it 
when I started reaching out to schools and districts about it and just specific educators was uh, high, more than I anticipated. The, the sessions would sell out and, uh, and it continues to be high. Um, you know, it's a program that I've really tried to design to, um, to get towards fixing and solving the issues that uh, the Muslim community has with the public education system and trying to start to ease the anxiety that we have over the kids being in the public education system. Because the reality is our kids are going to be in the public education system. I'll have a, I'll have a video on my Instagram page I'll post about this, but we, we don't with the amount of kids and we're a young population, the Muslim community overall, we have more school age kids than we have older people in our community. And that's something that is actually an advantage to us in, in terms of trying to educate people better about Muslims and about Islam and about what we want for our children. But we don't, but you know, there is lots of talk about putting all the kids in Islamic schools and we want that, we want homeschooling, all as you're saying, and I'm not against any of that. But the reality is we don't have the, we don't have the material resources to do that. Mm. Um, and even if we did have the material resources to do it, even less so, we don't have the, the, the human capital resources to do it because we don't have enough Muslims in teaching. We don't have enough Muslims in teaching. So the reality is we, we have to educate, you know, there's going to be over 90%. I would estimate probably 95, 98% of Muslim kids in America. They're going to spend their school careers in public education. That means they're going to spend 16,000 hours of their lives in public that's education. Ju that's just the reality. That is, that is just the reality. That's just the reality. Yeah. But it, you know, it's also an opportunity. It's also an opportunity. Yes, sir. So the public education system is going to raise our kids, and we need to be proactive about asserting what we want, how we want our kids to be raised. Now, the good news is the culture of education and the general disposition that your average educator has, and certain things about the way education is actually structured in America, it, educators actually want us to tell them this very, very much so. Right. They're, I would say they are eager to learn about what we actually want for our kids and extraordinarily open-minded. You know, for me, you know, people have a lot of anxiety about what they're feeling with kids. Having done all this uh, consulting and educating of, of people in education, I feel positive. I, I feel positive about the direction we can take things in education right? because I've experienced so much eagerness from, from teachers to learn. This is a very important point about the intention of the uh, public educators and the public sector, which I want to get into it. Uh, going back to the main title, so we're talking about Muslim issues in public education system and how to address those issues. And Brother Michael, mashallah, uh, is an expert i would say in that because he's been in the system for a while he's teaching he's still in the trenches which is you know for myself I, i've kind of like left that and you know gotten to uh you know being a school principal consultancy and so on but he's like on the ground so i would say mashallah you're more experienced in that than me and also i've been away from the west for quite some time but what i wanted to ask you brother uh brother michael before we get into the issues themselves um, give us a little bit of background about yourself. Mashallah, you are uh, an American, right? Born in America? Yeah. Mashallah. Are you a convert? Yes. Mashallah. Okay. Uh, when did you convert to Islam? Uh, two, 2007. 2007? 2007. Sorry, maybe you're not comfortable to talk about it, but you know, I'm sure that our audience would love to know a little bit about you. So, um, Mashallah, what's your background? How did you convert to Islam? Just a quick, you know, few minutes, Mashallah, if you can give us, that would be... Amazing. I'm interested. Well, you know, I'm mostly my my my. I'm mostly born and raised. In, I was born in Minnesota. Uh, you know, I did live in New Jersey for five years growing up. Um, my parents are from New York State, so I was, I'm somewhat of a transplant into Minnesotan. But <laughs> but I have adopted a lot about Minnesota culture. And if you know Minnesotans, we are very private people. So I, I you okay. Know, I, I don't think there's too much about my life story. Just that's a all. little bit. <laughs> you know, I mean, one thing. My my my. My, my paternal lineage is Syrian, so my, oh, my father was the, my father was the grandchild of Syrian immigrants. So, okay. uh, so you know, I was a senior in high school uh, during 9/11, and then all the politics blew up with, um, right. you know, between America and, and the West, and 
you know, that sort of put the extent to which I had Arab identity on, in the spotlight. And, you know, and then I wanted to learn more about that. So, so, so I studied the, you know, I have a degree in political science at the University of Minnesota. I had a, my area of concentration was the political history of the Muslim world in the 20th century. So, awesome. so I, that, that was how I started learning about Islam. And then, you know, I, but, but of course, to honestly learn about Islam, I had to go to sources outside the university, which yeah. were provided to me by the Somali community here in Minnesota. Mashallah. It's and, a big community know, well, in Minnesota. Yeah, mashallah. It's a blessing. Mashallah. It's a huge, it's a huge blessing. And, and they have a good reputation here, I will say. Okay. And me, I, 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 people know me, I really have a strong dislike for media in all sorts of ways. And okay. I'm getting back on social media these days to make people more aware of this type of work. But I really don't like that effect that it has on people. Right. But people who are actually, you know, such as public school teachers, people who are actually working with these families and these kids, mm -hmm. they have a positive impression of them. And, and, and me, I felt that too, living in the city. I had, you know, seeing them from the periphery. They, you know, no specific person like talked right. to me about Islam, mm -hmm. but just seeing their social connectiveness uh, was a big thing. Um, in all, all different types of aspects, you know, t attending school, because I first attended a community college where there was a lot of East African immigrants to it, you know, they were often the more engaged students. Certainly when it came to global things, they were more educated about it, more participatory than people of my background. So all of that just impressed me very much. And then contrasting yeah. that with the political talk going on at the time yeah. led me to actually study Islam. And just like most people, you know, when I learned about Islam, it, it struck me as being the truth. So, Beautiful. Mashallah, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa bless. Yes, uh, I did uh, myself grow up with Somali, uh, Somalis in uh, Canada and went to high school with them. And they're just uh, interesting and amazing people, mashallah, you know. And I remember they, they really liked me. I don't know. They really pulled to me, you know. We used to play football together. And they're just really cool guys, nice guys. They're always, uh, I mean, I didn't feel judged by them or, you know. Or anything like that, which is very, very accepting and very interested in who I was and all that. Even at the yes. time I was a Christian. And so part of that really, I can say it, it really impressed me. And, you know, as they say, uh, everyone has a, a friend named Abdi. <laughs> so I had a Somali friend named, <laughs> named Abdi and he was till today, you know, mashallah. Yeah, he's, you know, we go back like 20 something years now, mashallah. Excellent. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and so, you know, the, the, I, I will say, you know, so the extent to which their community here is politicized is a shame, mm -hmm. yeah, but but people who actually interact with them have a very positive experience very positive. with them and, and positive shot. impression of them. Other people will want me to say too, our Muslim population here in Minnesota is not just Somalis. It's about half, it's about half Somalis, but we have all the, you know, all the different diasporas here, just like in the other metro area. Yeah. Okay, Muslim issues in the public education system. Um, it's a big topic and we have, uh, you know, a lot of things to discuss, but before we get into, um, I want to, I want to go next to a point to the point of intention of the non-Muslims in the education system. But before that, the book, okay. Engaging Muslims, Muslim students in the public schools, in public schools, what educators need to understand. This is your book, mashallah. It was, uh, you know, Zakal Khair for sending me a copy. Alhamdulillah oh, yeah. is, I mean, this is, I don't know if I can call it a book. It's like a manual. It's like a, a guide for public educators to know Muslim students, to know Islam, to know pretty much. It's very comprehensive. Like it's very, very comprehensive manual that I believe it's geared towards non-Muslims. Is that correct? Can you tell us a little bit about the book and how people can get hold of this? Well, I mean, the, 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 the book is formatted out from the training, you know, like I did the training, you know, really, I, I developed the training throughout my years doing my teaching license and my grad work um, in university here. Um, and then again, I, I initially put a framework for the training together, initially did it with two cohorts of teachers, developed it, started doing it privately, you know, so, so I mean, each chapter that I have in the book correlates to a part of the training and the learning continuum is the same. So at the time I wrote the book, I spent the 2019-2020 uh, school year not doing the training, but putting the book together, you know. Um, so so the, 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 the book, it's really just built on all my work in, in education and, and research and experience uh, soliciting things from teachers, you know, like. 
So, you, you know, teachers, they have a high professional interest to learn about Islam because they know, because they're teaching Muslim kids, they experience Muslims in a real world way, in a real world way. And, you know, so, so what you see there is, you know, I teach about the research and education that justifies the learning, the history of Muslims in America, so people understand the diversity that they see in the Muslim community. And then, you know, a long part of the book is spent walking people through Islam, separating the beliefs from the technicalities of following it. And then with each point, I relate it to actual things that I know to come up in a public school setting and teach, you know, to teach teachers how to not give offense and how to not make, not do things, not make kids do things that conflict with the religion, which, which happens unintentionally all the time because people don't have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, try to teach them how to actually leverage the predictable background knowledge that Muslim kids have, the predictable background experience that they have as Muslims. And yeah, you know, so it's so it's been highly appreciated by people. Alhamdulillah. So people can, mashallah, if you they can go to your website, I believe, and order the book, right? Abrahameducation. Abrahameducation.com. I mean, the book's yeah. primarily on Amazon. That's what yeah, that's where you can also just search the name on so, Amazon. Yep. The access yeah, you guys to have the. To go ahead. Check this out: engaging yep. Muslim students in public schools, which takes me to back to my question. And maybe here uh, we have a difference of opinion because if you see through my videos, mm. I do, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, it's a conspiracy theory, but I believe it's a reality that people who are driving, you know, uh, policies and change within the education system, which obviously affects curriculum, I do believe that they are, they have a, a goal of, I mean, in America specific, obviously, you know, the philosophy is, you know, to basically is the melting pot. Um, so I'm not sure if you agree with me or not, but we're talking about intention. You said people are honest and they really want to understand Muslims. And I don't doubt that teachers on the ground, your colleagues and my colleagues have, you know, an ulterior, ulterior motive. But being, traveling the world and having dealt with, I would say, um, governments and organizations who change policies, drive policies, design curriculum, and so on. I was, I could say more than, you know, more than a few times that I noticed that there was an intention to target Muslims and to change, to de-radicalize them, to, and when I mean de-radicalization to these people, sometimes it means like changing fundamentals of Islam at the curriculum level. So what do you think uh, about that? Like, what's, what's your take on that? Having been there, you're on the ground, you're working with people. What's your opinion on that? Well, firstly, I don't operate on a policy level with anything. Okay, I operate on an interpersonal level with people. Okay. And my training, no one does my training, but that they choose to come to it and they choose to opt into it. Mm -hmm. So one approach to professional development in education can be you try to get a school board to pass something that everyone's going to do this training or you try to get administration to say everyone's going to do this training there's actually limited capacity of those entities to do that to, to force teachers to take a certain training right. i'll explain why in a moment but that's not that's not the approach i take i don't take it but that anyone they see the purpose for it and they want it for themselves so that that's that's thing number one i don't operate on a policy level i recommend to people especially if you have kids in, in public schools, to not worry about operating on a policy level, especially in America, because it's not the best place to do advocacy. Operate on an interpersonal level with the teachers who teach your kids and the principals who teach your kids and just recommend these resources to them. Now, why, why, why is that the most effective way? Now, I understand in, you know, in international education and, and, and the way education is structured in the Muslim world commonly, a lot of times people have the impression that the way education is done is a ministry creates a curriculum. The curriculum consists of a series of books. Those books are handed down to the teachers and the teachers walk through them A to Z. And that's right. what's done. American education is not American education is not structured that way at all. American education is first and foremost local. And that part has to do with the Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which restricts the federal government from creating a national curriculum. The, at the state Good level point. of government, at the state level of government, things, you know, there can be laws passed that certain things are going to be taught, but the culture is really more that these broad standards are, are, are adopted and mm -hmm. that teachers have to do things within the standards. 
Now at the district level, districts will put together curriculum outlines that correlate to what the state standards are. But the number one determining factor of what gets taught to a child in an American public school classroom is the individual discretion of the teacher in that classroom. Why? Because the vast majority of schools in America operate with a teacher union having a contract with the school district. And even the ones that don't, they are influenced by the culture that is set by the teachers unions and the contracts between the district. Now those teacher union contracts, they offer the teacher protection, especially if the teacher has three, four, five years of experience and they've achieved tenure. They offer the teacher protection from having very limited evaluation and in reality, limited accountability to what they actually do. So there is evaluation processes it, that are done in American public school systems and a teacher goes through a certain amount of observations from their principal or who or their supervisor or whoever, but the amount that that can actually be done is very, very limited. Mm -hmm. And again, the curriculum outlines they have, they more exist of these broad categories and the books that are used, the specific things all, and all the specifics that are taught, that is, com that, the, again, the biggest determining factor of that is the discretion of the teacher and, 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 and the job of the district and their supervisors is really more to provide them the resources that they want to use in their classroom and also to develop themselves professionally. So this is why I say that, you know, the most effective thing for parents to do is to just go to their teacher and go to their kid's teacher. They can give them my book and say, please, I want you to understand my mm -hmm. child as a Muslim. So and this was gonna, I was going to ask you, do you think then if, if that's the way it's structured? Because yeah, I was talking more on a policy level internationally um you know in, in muslim countries for example you get a, at least two evaluations per year you could have 10 years experience it doesn't matter <laughs> and they can boot you out anytime anyone complains there is no protection in many countries sadly but uh, could we say then that we could make an argument that muslims should get more should get involved more into the educational system in dealing with their teachers of, of their ch of their children um you know um, meeting the, the teachers, meeting the principals, uh, connecting them to your book, to work such as yours. So, you know, a lot of parents in the Muslim, in the non-Muslim countries, sorry, in America, UK and so on, they don't really get engaged in the, uh, you know, the education of their children. Like they'll check maybe the homework and so on and whatnot, but they're not, they don't like to go talk to the teachers. They don't like to attend the uh, parent-teacher interviews, that was one of my issues working in, in the West. A lot of parents were not showing up, you know what I mean, for the Muslim students. So could we make an argument that there's a great opportunity here as we are discussing issues, you know, Muslim issues in the public education system. And one of the issues is the lack of engagement maybe of the Muslim community when it comes to that. And maybe there's, is there fear there from the Muslim community? Are they questioning well, for, the intention for, of the teachers or of the system? You know, for, first of all, 100% they should get more involved. And if they don't get involved, there's other families who are involved, you know, in, in, in what in white, sub, you know, in white suburban communities. I mean, it, it is a it is a given that, that, that you're involved in the school. And I mean, in those communities, the parents, they will often treat their kids teacher and the kids principal like they are their servant. Now they, they pay the same tuition as as Muslim parents or any other parent who has their kid right. in the public education system. But you, you know, the, but the, the the culture in America is that schools are local first. Now, there, I would say more than anything, there's just anxiety. There's just anxiety about you know. There's just we have a whole lot of general anxiety in the Muslim community about engage, about engaging non-Muslims, for good reason. For good reason. Now, I've tried to create my materials, the book and the course, as to be a vehicle towards easing that anxiety, because for a lot of parents, the fear is you know if I go and try to advocate for my kid. You know, I have to enter someone else's framework. And, you know, educating non-Muslims about Islam is an intimidating endeavor, always. Indeed. So, you know, Indeed. so, so, you know, do, so there's, so there's, so, there's, so it becomes a, a legitimate confidence issue about how do I really do it? You know, mm. so, so again, just my recommendation as a starting point is to even just send them the links, just send them the links. And, P, and people in education, they're very, very responsive to email. Mm. And, you know, too, like written communication in American culture, it has a certain weight to it. It has a certain oh, yeah. has, has a certain weight to it. Like people really take it take it seriously. So even just email, you know, a respectful, polite, well mannered email to a school principal to your kid's teacher, 
you know, just, just simply say as, as a Muslim parent, you know, we, 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 want our, we want our children to be well understood by their teachers and by their principals. You know, Muslim parents will often say to their kids' teacher, and, and, and you know, there's lots of Muslim parents who, who are doing advocacy for their, right. for, for, for their kids. There is. And they will often say to the teacher, please treat my child like they're your own child. And, th and that's right. a beautiful message to give to the teacher. And the yeah. teachers do take that to heart. But then they want to know the practical how to. And that's, that's what I've put my materials uh, together for, to, to give them the tools and knowledge to do that. So could we also argue, Brother Michael, that um, I think I'm not sure, uh, I didn't see it in the book, but are you targeting the Muslim community as well of, of like teaching them and educating them how to engage non-Muslim educators, how to break the ice and how to go forward and, you know, write the emails. Like a lot of people might not know what you just said, that yeah. there's a, there's yeah, a huge I mean, weight in American culture when it comes to written emails and so on. Right. So are you doing anything to target the Muslim community, the masajid and so on? to educate them on how to be better, you know, at engaging public educators, which would obviously well, result in the educators engaging their children better? Well, I mean, I would say that's maybe what I'm stepping into by being on this platform, you know, and, okay. you, you know, so most of the reach I've done has been to K through 12 educators just directly to, 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 to get the training going and get its legitimacy established within, within the field. Um, you know, I've honestly, I've reached out to lots of people. I've reached out to lots of organizations, lots of different people. I'm here because you're the one who responded, to be honest. You know? Alhamdulillah. So, 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 I mean, that, that, that's work to be done. And, you know, yes. um, and like I said, I, you know, I started an Instagram page not to partake in the social media right. culture. I understand some people need to be in that and doing that mm -hmm. and, and the back and forth that go on. I'm not interested in that at all. But, but, what, but what I'm trying to make my Instagram page and looking into, I should probably make a Facebook page too, right. is like a gathering place between educators who've done my training. And then I, and then I have a fair amount of young people on there now. And, and, and then just Muslims who are interested in these topics in a productive, well-mannered way, you know, and, and I'm going to be just doing talks about there, you know, to, to these different factions, to, 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 you know, one thing I'm trying to do on there is to show both the non-Muslim educators I have and, and Muslim parents how I talk to young people, you know, and, and, and how I talk to young people is based on how I do it in the public school. So it is a more secularized talk because that is what you have to do as a public nice. educator. But the reality is, you know, the values of Islam that we share, especially as they pertain to manners and conduct, are things that public schools absolutely want reinforced to kids. But there is a way to do it in a secular fashion that is more likely to resonate with a kid who has a background, has a learning background as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And that and the, those are the types of those are the types of soft skills that te that the non-Muslim teachers need transferred to them. And there's even an extent to which Muslim parents need those uh, skills transferred to them as well, because sometimes that talk resonates with the kids more they're, they're, because because they because they only hear the Islamic talk in an isolated context. Right. So, I mean, these, so, you know, I just started the Instagram page, but I do encourage people to join it, be respectful if you participate on it, or, or I will do whatever I have to to make sure you're not there. But, but that's part of what I'm trying to, to nurture on that platform a little bit. And, and, you know, that's, this is something I can talk about. So I, I like, maybe that, that's something I'll talk about there. If you're going to send an email to um, a, a teacher, this is what you say, or to a principal, this is what you say. You know, there's a big power, there's a big power in writing too, and having something written out. Uh, communication, thinking it Masha. through. Okay, so we're discussing fixing Muslim issues in public education. It is the first episode in a series, inshallah, that Brother Michael Abraham and myself are going to address as we feel that, yeah, we want to make sure that we offer these this experience, this, this huge experience, alhamdulillah, uh, both of us, alhamdulillah, to solve some problems within the Muslim community, the Muslim Umar, worldwide. Now, I know Brother Michael is uh, targeting the um, Western education system, but I think it, it can extend to a lot of countries like Australia, for example. Inshallah, we're going to have some educators from Australia joining us tonight. There was supposed to be one with us, but she couldn't make it. SubhanAllah, Qadar Allah. Uh, the UK, where we have huge Muslim communities who are confused as to what to do. How do they engage public educators? What are the alternatives to public education, if there are any, if they're viable, if not? So we're going to discuss all these things. But um, let us go back to our topic and let us start addressing 
and highlighting some issues. Now, you, uh, brother Michael, um, are teaching now. You are still a teacher. I think you've just uh, entered into your vacation, mashallah, right? Uh, yes. You finished, right? Alhamdulillah. Right. So congrats on that, mashallah. Exactly. I hope you enjoy your time off. And uh, I would like to ask you, what would be some of the issues you were to list them, you know, in, in terms of priority? What would be the, the greatest issue right now that we as uh, experts in this field should address? The parents are, you know, they're, they're, they need to understand and then just going down and listing a few maybe and then we can address and see how we can fix them as well. As I said, we're going to have more sessions, so we don't need to rush. But what would be some of the issues that we that need fixing? Well, look, the, the, the way I structure my book and my training is, you know, Muslims, the values foundationally are set by Islam. Mm -hmm. So the, the approach of the book and the train is to walk the non-Muslim educator through Islam in mm -hmm. an organized manner where each thing is in its place as it should be. And then talk about how each one of those things comes up in everyday life in a public school because it does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, the first thing I do in the chapter that begins talking about Islamic beliefs is I explain how Islam is sourced. Because you, when you're talking with any non-Muslim from the West, you have to establish that Islam is foundationally based on what its texts say. Right. And you know, the, the, the way that a non-Muslim will usually want to go with a discussion about religion is for them, it can be something that is individually subjective because that is the way, because they project their own religious understanding from their Western experience onto us. Right. So, you know, Christianity has become very subjective, even and even with the Catholic Church, you have an organized body that can change things. You have to make people understand that Islam simply does not work that way. Once you do that, you set the frame of the discussion and the foundation of what you're operating on with people to the, pro to the proper manner that it should be on. Because it's no longer really about, you know, me personally or any individual person personal, or really even about negotiating what the values are. We can just talk about them as they are. You know, so after doing that, I, I get into the five pillars and, you know, just, and with each one, there's a lot to unpack. Now, just with the first pillar, you know, there, a big thing that teachers need, that, that any non-Muslim really who controls environments that we're in, but that K through 12 educators need to understand, you know, they sense we have certain religious sensibilities. You know, they need to know that we have a prohibition against imitating other religions. So, you know, I, I explain Islamic monotheism and, you know, and I explain what that means and I explain what shirk is. Now, a, it happens a lot in public schools. And, and, you know, and I show the Islamic text so people understand the psychological weight that these things have on us because shirk is a big deal. So it happens a lot in public schools that the educators put kids through things that is imitating shirk, but they don't know it. So if they're studying Greek, so just some examples, if they're studying Greek mythology, they make the kids do a play where the right. kids act out roles as greek gods gods yeah. okay that is not something we want our kids to do and they have to know why if they're doing an art project and they're learning about japanese culture they have the kids create a mock shinto temple you know right. th 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 those are curriculum level things that happen that need to be altered you know not that those things cannot be studied in a clinical fashion and i reinforce that through the book because in a liberal education yes of course they can and you want diversity of opinion uh, opinion and this holistic type learning but you know, but 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 you need to understand where the sensitivities lie to not make the kids do certain things. On a smaller interpersonal level, it's extraordinarily common that our that teachers themselves, and certainly kids pick this up from other kids, they'll they'll, they'll tell kids to cross their fingers in hope that something good is going to happen in the future. Right. They'll tell them to knock on wood after okay. speaking on the future. So you know, Western culture is just full of these little superstitious phrases which have a historical origin to them. And, uh, you know, a non-Muslim teacher says those things without even thinking about it. So when I talk this out with teachers, it's a huge realization for them of just things they're doing without even thinking about it. And again, they don't feel bad about it. They appreciate the knowledge. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, that's just thing number one. Now, of course, with the second pillar, with the prayer, the prayer is a huge thing because, you know, even in elementary schools, they do so much interacting with family. They do so much outside school activities. Schools really need to know how to appropriately accommodate the prayer. And so a big, so 
in chapter three and part three of the training, chapter three of the book, going through the beliefs, I talk about the psychological weight that the prayer has on us. And I show them the hadith, and I'm not the greatest at always recalling the specific wording of hadith, but the, the hadith that when the servant arrives on the day of judgment, the first thing he'll be asked about is the prayer. Yeah. And he's, if it's sound, he's successful. If it's not sound, he fails. And I explain what that means as far as your determination in the afterlife in an Islamic understanding of the world. So, you know, that really brings home the psychological weight that this has behind us because a lot of teachers, they know that we pray five times a day, but again, in their minds, they're going to think of it as something more subjective. I will tell you, I I have had principals cry in front of me when explaining this to them because they realized what they had been doing, what their ignorance had been doing for so long in not forming a proper atmosphere to accommodate the prayer. And in order for schools to accommodate the prayer property, the reality is they have to have a really detailed knowledge of the process. And if they have any knowledge of it before, what they've got is what I would call pamphlet type information, where they're just told generally, okay, they need 15 minutes to prayer and they need a room to do it in. You know, that type of limited information, a lot of times it actually really backfires because Mm -hmm. then they will do something that nominally accommodates it, but it doesn't authentically accommodate it because the details aren't worked out. So when the kid leaves the classroom to go to the prayer room, to go to the room where they're going to pray, but they will and say, they get, say, okay, you're going to pray in the library at 12 o'clock or 1230. Well, when the kid starts walking towards the bathroom, the teachers start to get mad at them. Hey, you're not going where you're supposed to be because they don't know that they have to right. wash before it. <laughs> if they do know they need to wash, they don't know the whole process of washing. The bathrooms in America are not set up to accommodate making wudu. Right. So the kids make a, uh, so they're going to make a mess in the bathroom. So what, so there needs to be a plan in place to clean up after that. Right. You know, and just with the timing, I show in really detail how the timing of the prayer changes throughout the year. Because you right. can say 1230 is going to be our time. And schools right. like things to be consistent in consistent. their schedule. Yes, so exactly. if they're going to schedule a time for the kids to do it, which the, which the Muslim kids have a, have, a, have a constitutional right to in the United States. If they're going to set a time for them to do it, okay, you can set it at 1230. But then what happens when daylight savings comes? And now right. 1230 doesn't work for it anymore. Right. You know, and, the, and, and the, you know, the contraction of the days and all this, they have to understand all that stuff and they have to know it in detail so that they can plan around it properly. And so, so that is the big thing. So I go through all that and talk, talk about that. And you know, I talk about how for us, the prayer is the foundation of good conduct for a person. Mm. And, and, you know, the, and the reality is you know, living in the West, you know, we're, we're going through all sort of psychological difficulties over the, uh, over the nonstop struggle that we have to do this because we're constantly environments in environments that non-Muslims control. And, you know, that makes it so the only person who can really practice Islam and really fulfill the obligations becomes like a rare individual. And, right. and, and you know, because you have to do all this interpersonal constant striving just, just mm-hmm. to do it. So, you know, it's, it's just a really important type of uh, education for us to it's do. It's amazing that you mentioned that, that uh, the person who's going to fulfill the responsibilities of Islam will be almost like an exception. And, you know, linking to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that, you know, it'll be <laughs> like holding a hot coal in your hand. You know, it'll be so hard to hold on to your deen to, mm-hmm. to do everything that Islam re- uh, requires you to do. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do you deal, though, with the contradiction that some non-Muslim educators might see. Uh, you've talked about the issue of shirk and children participating in some place, you know. I know one of the big ones is Christmas, right? They have nativity scenes and uh, Christmas concerts. They have... Not, not in the U.S. Alan, huh? They don't? <laughs> no, no, in a public school know. in the U.S. there's no nativity stuff. That's a, I think that's a U.K. thing, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean that's... Although, though, those, though there's still things. Could be, yeah. Well, well, so, look, I, like even like Valentine's, sorry, Valentine's yeah. and, and maybe Halloween and whatnot. But what I'm trying to say is, what about the liberal Muslims who they like, I don't care, I'll participate, right? So how do you, how do you uh, address that where, where educators might say like, but, you know, Muhammad doesn't care. He's, look, he's participating. He's the lead role and he's, his family is supporting him. So why do you guys have to make such a big fuss? I don't see it. So it's like there's a disagreement between the, the Muslims themselves in terms of the, how do you explain that? Well, well, I, I do explain it. And look, so first thing, as far as what the educators do, you know, I operate, you know, as I said, teachers have a lot of agency in American schools. So ultimately the information, the suggestions, it is for them to decide and grapple with what they do. 
Mm-hmm. So they, so, you know, they, 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 they make decisions at the end of the day. It's not like I mandate anyone to do anything, mm-hmm. but I will say, you know, teachers, you get pressures from all different types of places. As a teacher, it's a highly stressful job, but usually the last thing any teacher, any principal in school wants is parents to be upset with them. That right. is usually the, the strongest place pressure. I will say that much. So they really want to know what parents actually want. You know, thing. Okay, so holiday celebrations are a thing because schools do celebrations around holidays. Right. So that's where it's very important. Where I elucidate the prohibition we have against imitating other religions, because the way that schools have have tried to reconcile this already, they will change Valentine's Day to Friendship Day, or they will change Halloween party to Wacky Hair Day, or this type of thing. So I show them the texts that show that we prohibit imitation of the other religions too. Right. And so so that so this doesn't really work for us. Now, you know, the, the whole discussion about like li- liberal Muslims, I, I would say non-Muslim educators, they're not really sensitive to that. They don't experience us and experience us, our kids in that way. They know that we're, they know it's a conservative community. They see enough from our kids and enough from our parents to know that. So, so, so that's really not too much a thing. But for the kids who do partake in it and, you know, and, uh, and, you know, birthday celebrations, of course, are big things they do in schools. Right. And, of course, we've had a generation of young Muslims here who've been conditioned into celebrating their birthdays by the school system. Right. So I talk a lot about the concept of capitulation, about silent capitulation. And a big thing that the train does for people is it shows how the reality of being a Muslim living in the West is you are constantly capitulating on your religion. And especially when it comes to the raising of your kids in these atmospheres. So... In this way, it's framed as giving them a window beneath the surface of the kids' culture. And, you know, the culture of education right now has educators very, very primed to receive that type of information in a good Mm -hmm. way. Because there's a lot of talk about multiculturalism. There's a lot of talk about racial equity. There is a lot of talk about, um, you know, not putting the dominant culture onto kids. So teachers are feeling a lot of like guilt about that on their side. But a thing that teachers really appreciate about my training is they're given like actual concrete practical insights into what that means for this group of kids and, and this group of families. So, I mean, so, so, the, so the kids who do do that, that doesn't necessarily act as like validation for, to, for, to argue against it on the part of the teacher. They don't usually see it that way. They see that as a manifestation of this, this compromise and the sacrifice and this capitulation that we're making. And, and, and I will tell you, the average public school educator, they want to nurture the kids in the classroom the way that those kids' parents and families want them to be nurtured. No doubt. There's no doubt in my mind, my experience from that. And honestly, there's research to back that up as well. Okay, we have about five minutes left, inshallah. And of course, we are going to continue this series for those who are going to follow us, inshallah. So you do check up our uh, links in the description brothers and sisters please and make sure you subscribe and go to brother michael's uh, links as well on his instagram and subscribe and make sure you follow his work so we're discussing the issue of yeah, addressing muslim issues in the public system so you are going you basically educate the educators on what does islam mean and it is da'wah it is in you know a form of da'wah. People are being told what Islam is, what Muslim students believe, and how they can approach Muslim students to be better educators, to help them, to to nurture them in, in a healthy environment that is somehow uh, going to not cause any problems for anyone, right? Um, people do not like to have issues when it comes to education, when it comes to differences in culture. I mean, these are sometimes unavoidable we see we see that these things still happen even in the united states which is supposed to be one of or advocates that it is one of the greatest countries when it comes to freedoms and respecting cultures and so on that can be debated <laughs> and so on but but basically your manual and your work is is dawah in a sense is that correct well i mean if dawah means calling people to islam in all honesty it's not that like I, okay. you know, and it's for someone else to say what the de- technical definition of Dawa is. Okay? okay. I'm not the person to ask about that, but you know, you know, I talk about Muslims and Islam in a clinical fashion, in an evidence-based fashion mm-hmm. to show people, this is what it is. And this is why you see the things that you see in your classroom. 
and this is what's underneath the surface and etc so you know from there it becomes the person's choice to do to do what they want with the information you know the people who come to my training they don't have a personal interest in islam they have a professional interest in islam and it's work that is curated to meet that professional interest and you know we, we have this sort of gridlock in trying to educate the non-Muslims about Islam that, you know, all Muslims want to break through. You know, the people who tend to learn about Islam in Western society are people who have a personal interest in it, maybe a negative one sometimes, more mm -hmm. often a personal one because they're curious about religion or whatever. Right. But public school teachers, they have a professional interest in it. And it's the largest professionally licensed occupation that there is in America. So it's really something that I advise Muslims to think of as the next step in trying to educate the society about Islam and just do it in an interpersonal way. Just approach mm -hmm. your child's. You can, if you don't have children, you can go to your former teacher or your former school. You can email them saying, I wish that this book and this train had been known about when I was a kid in, in schools. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know, I just, you know, in a soft hearted, open hearted way, just go to principals, go to teachers, just say, you know, I want you to read this book. I want you to consider taking this course because it will it will help us be un understood. And I'll tell you, people will be you'll find people very very open to that, very very open to that. And oh. and you know, fr and then from there, if if they if they do it, then you have a different framework of having further conversations with them and and further, you know, you, and and further talking about how you want your child to be nurtured and raised. Mashallah, just a small anecdote here, just to concept of niya or intention yeah maybe you're not directly doing dawah you're not that's not maybe your the way it's structured as you said it's more clinical mashallah and same with uh, you know parents they might you know not necessarily have to call directly hey why don't you become a muslim but if the niya is there to educate to teach people about what islam is and you have the intention to hey but if someone sees it it's not necessarily uh, you know invasive it's just a bit more passive but if someone sees that, you know, this is information, this information, I want to know more about it. I want to engage more with it. SubhanAllah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides people uh, in ways that we see sometimes, you know, some of the stories of the converts to Islam, that they didn't have an interest in actually Islam. That was not their main intention. They, either they've heard something, they wanted to read a book, they wanted to refute it, they wanted to attack it maybe, and they didn't necessarily have a positive interest into Islam. And some people are just passive. It just happens, subhanAllah. So indeed, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whoever he wills and whoever he sees his hearts and what they desire, subhanAllah. So it just takes a small intention of a person, uh, you know, to, to make, to, to transform anything, any project into, inshallah, a Dao project and to inform about Islam. And inshallah, we wish for everyone to, inshallah, learn about Islam and to embrace Islam. Of course, that would be the greatest uh, success. But that doesn't mean we cannot force anyone. I mean, we don't force anyone, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, la yukallifu Allahu nafsan. Uh, sorry, la ikraha fi din. There is no compulsion in the faith, right? So that is something that we know. Brother Michael Abraham, author of the book, uh, Engaging Muslim Students in Public Schools. Okay, it is available online at abrahameducation.com. Links will be in the description, inshallah. It was a great pleasure to have you tonight, and we will continue uh, these series, ta'ala. and I do encourage everyone to please check out his work and send us your questions, and uh, we're going to try to address some things. We're going to continue next time with some of the issues within the public education system and how to fix them. Inshallah, today we talked about the book. We talked about the way the book is structured, the approach. And the main objective of the book and of the work that Brother Michael does is basically to help public educators in America, specifically in Minnesota, how to deal with Muslim students, how to engage them better, how to reach out to them, how to be more nurturing. And it seems that that is the uh, intention of most of them, alhamdulillah, inshallah, to do that. There's a culture in America that is, you know, set up that way where people want to help others, people want to understand others, and people want to do their job in the most professional way they can. And of course, uh, we need more Muslims within the Muslim community to understand this work so they can get engaged and involved in the education system, in the lives of their children, their educational life, to facilitate this transfer of information, 
and that it's healthy, that it does not contradict Islam, as Brother Abraham outlines in his book, right? The concept of shirk and just helping uh, non-Muslim teachers understand what, what does the text say? What is the evidence for what we are claiming? And this, how important that has an effect, on a psychological effect, as you said, for example, prayer and so on, on the children, on the students. Barakallah fiqh, jazakallah khair, brother Michael Abraham, for being with us today, inshallah. I hope to see you soon. Inshallah, it was a great discussion. And for brothers and sisters who are interested in this topic, we will have a live broadcast coming up, inshallah. We're going to announce that soon where you can actually get on the platform and be engaged and actually maybe call in and ask questions and so on. So it can be more dynamic. We can, act, we can actually answer your questions and offer solutions to some of the real problems that you are faced with as parents living in the West and their children are attending the public educational system. Jazakumullah khair for tuning in today. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.